information? Yes. So, well, conformal technique. So, I'll just throw the buzzword in. I mean, there's something fundamental that people are interested in quantum information and quantum matter, which is called entanglement entropy. Mm. And that's something that you compute. It's captured by a partition function, if you wish, by essentially gluing different regions of space-time together that are pinned by a point. OK, in, in two dimensions would be by a point. In d dimensions, by a co-dimension to ob object. And essentially, entanglement entropy has to do with a certain correlator of the stress tensor in the presence of that operator, which is called a twist field. And that's how Cardi and Calabrese computed it in two dimensions, for example. Entanglement entropy, like a uh, model independent way of computing the entanglement entropy just using conformal techniques. Yeah, so that's, that's one example. Yeah. And now entanglement entropy is kind of the biggest, I mean, it's a very popular subject. In, not only in quantum information, but in high energy physics, black holes, it's, it's everywhere. But that, that, that's, I mean, concretely, that's what I had in mind. If I, if I had more time, I, I would do that calculation. It's a, it's a nice calculation of how to compute entanglement entropy from just conformal transformation. OK, other than that, any other comments, questions? No? So I don't know if it was trivial or too, too fast. I don't know. Is it one of the two? OK, so let, now let me tell you what the, the plan for the at least tentative plan for the next few days. So what we want to, what I want to do rather than outline is to study the uh, conformal geometry. So what, what is the action of conformal transformations in space time and get an intuition of what is the group of transformations that generate conformal transformations just from a geometrical point of view. And then, of course, we're ultimately interested in how this uh, applies to quantum field theory. So what we, want, we, what, what we want to do, usually in quantum field theory, what, what we're interested in is computing observables like correlation functions of, of local operators, also non-local operators. And essentially what we will want to do next is to study how uh, to realize the symmetries on operators in a conformal field theory. Want to understand how conformal symmetry is realized and on operators, we will impose the constraints and then derive constraints, very strong constraints on the form of the correlators, correlation function. So you're used to some constraints that Poincare invariance imposes, say, when you compute the two-point function of an operator here and here, or three-point function or four-point function. What we will see is that conformal symmetry leads to a huge restriction on the form of the correlators that is partially responsible for the fact that we can solve, in some cases, the theory completely, especially in low, in, in low dimensions, two dimensions. And then, in, in some sense, by doing this analysis, we will in some sense, find out what is the irreducible data, the certain irreducible data that if you, someone gives it to you, you have, a, in some sense, a complete, algo, a complete solution of the theory. So what we'll find is that if you know, essentially, the two-point functions as, 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 that means that for any, any pair of operators, If you know how to compute the two-point function, from which you can extract, as, we, as I will show, the scaling dimension, dimensions of operators, and if you know the three-point function, So this is, as we will see, something that's remarkable is that this guy, of course, in an arbitrary Lorentz, Lorentz invariant theory, this can be, an arbi can be arbitrarily complicated. No, not arbitrary, but it, it's, a, it's the, the, the dependence on the coordinate is not fixed. In conformal symmetry, it's completely fixed by a conformal symmetry. And there is a, an invariant tensor that 
has all the information, CABC. And then the claim is that putting together the list of all dimensions combined with the arbitrary three-point functions allows you to compute completely any endpoint function, essentially, okay? By essentially a kind of a gluing construction. So you can construct an endpoint function by factorizing it and doing some over intermediate states that uh, are captured by summing over the spectrum and with some structure constants or form factors that are the three-point function. So this is uh, algorithmically computes for you the completely solves the theory when it comes to study the, the problem of computing correlation functions of local operators, okay? As I will discuss briefly, there are other interesting objects in conformal field theories that are not local operators, and of course we also want to know about them, but for the purposes of studying local operators, this is a, it's called the, well, from this data, you, people use the, the conformal bootstrap idea that Pedro will be discuss next week. But essentially, by putting these together, these two data together, and using basic properties of, fact of factorization of correlators, you can completely solve for everything else. Okay. Then, we, so this is how to realize uh, conformal symmetry on operators. The, of course, in quantum field theory, we have to also realize the symmetries unitarily on the Hilbert space. So we we'll have to understand how to realize symmetry. the Hilbert space of the theory. And something remarkable that we will find in conformal field theory is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the states and operators in the conformal field theory. That's called the state oper operator correspondence. And another remarkable thing that we will use just using uh, this conformal symmetry is that we will find bounds that follow just by imposing. Notice that here I'm not telling you that I have a Lagrangian, I have some theory. This is just using constraints Theory independent constraints just imposing conformal symmetry. So, just by using this kind of uh, theory independent constraints, you can already know a lot about the theory. In particular, what you will find is that the dimensions of operators with various quantum numbers like spin, like imagine you're in four dimensions, so in four dimensions, uh, an operator is labeled by a, a Lorentz spin, so you have SG2 times SG2, say. And what you will find is that this guy satisfies some bounds. So this is some number that we will compute. And therefore, just without knowing anything, you know that if you have a conformal field theory and it's unitary, you already know something non-perturbative about the, the scaling dimension or the dimension of operators in that theory. Okay? And we will, the, 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 what we want to do is derive some bounds like that. And then the last, well, I don't know if it's the last, but another thing I want to discuss, which is the main reason for doing it is because it's, uh, it's not only relevant for conformal field theory, but it's relevant for any when you study symmetries in quantum field theory. And, but it's also very important when you apply it to conformal symmetries because it gives you huge constraints on the la types of RG flows. I, mean, I was talking about these RG flows, and it's that you could have monsters downstairs, but there are constraints on what kind of monsters can live in the infrared. So this will be a discussion of conformal anomalies. And we will understand that in certain situations, the symmetry, while these are the symmet this conformal symmetry can be broken quantum mechanically. We will, we will understand what this means. Okay. So any questions about the plan? No? Okay, so now I have to do some kind of build some machinery. And you have to tell me a little bit if some things are very well known, I can skip them. If, not, if they're not very well known, I can, I, I can go through them. Uh, but I'll, I'll start with, with something basic and then I'll, I'll keep asking you, okay? So as I said, so the, one of the main goals in a, in a conformal field theory is compute this, the observables. So the, the traditional observables that appear in textbooks are, as I already said, the correlation functions of local operators. So that's the thing that we want to compute. So this essentially is considering you are in, in D dimensions. I want to consider the insertion of uh, operators at various points, x1 up to xn, and just study how correlation functions behave. 
there is a very interesting thing that you can define even in standard field theory, but it's, part it's particularly powerful in this context of conformal field theory. Notice that O here is an abstract operator. It's not a field that appears in the path integral necessarily. Okay? So we want to solve for all these guys. This can be encoded into, into a nice way by a, by a kind of a partition function of the theory. You can think of this as a, the generating functional. Okay, let me call it. The generating functional of this type. So it's a partition function that is a function of J, okay? And that, uh, so this is a partition function. This guy is sometimes called the, uh, the um, generating function of connected correlators. As you know that if you take a, a partition function and you take the log of the partition function, that generates the connected correlation function. Of so if you know the connected correlation function, you know everything. Con correlation function. Okay. And essentially, abst abstractly, what we're trying to do is find this observable. If you have this observable, you can compute any correlation functions by, just by taking functional derivatives of this correlator. So, for example, if I take a functional derivative with respect to x on w, what this will do is bring down, let's say, j a, will bring down an operator o x. Here you could be other things if you have other functional derivatives, and this gives you the connected correlation function. Okay. And in the study of conformal anomalies, will be essentially the study of how this guy can fail to be conformal invariant in a very in a very definite sense, and what does this, what does this teach us about RG flow? Another thing that I want to mention, but of course I will not really have much time to say in this course, is that so traditionally this has been the, the the observables that people studied in conformal field theory. But it turns out that in conformal field theories, in two, three, in any dimension, there are also interesting non local observables, which are not supported on space time points, but they can be supported on some manifold. For example, an example of a, of a correlation function would be a, a, a correlation function that's defined on a, on a curve. And then a whole bunch of local operators. Okay, so it would be interesting computing some operator, which is non-local, but it's sorry, which is supported on some curve C, times some local operators like that. Okay, and these non-local observables in in recent years have made have played a prominent role not only in condensed matter physics but in high energy physics. They give you a lot of information about the structure of the theory. There's much more to theories than just the, the spectrum of local operators, okay? And they play an important role in field theories, dualities, all kinds of things. And then another important thing that you can study CFTs both abstractly but also in practice in real physical systems is that you can study conformal field theories not in the full space but in a space with a boundary. So here you have a boundary. And you can study the correlation functions of operators in the presence of some boundary condition. So here, this boundary, you have to impose some boundary conditions. If you want to preserve conformal invariance, you have to impose conformal invariant boundary conditions. And there can be several of them. And you can study the dependence of correlators of local operators or non-local operators as a function of the boundary, okay? And on this boundary, sometimes live interesting degrees of freedom. Um, and the study of boundary conformal field theory plays a prominent role in condensed matter physics, for example, when you study a condo problem, for example, okay? Okay, but before we're getting to kind of this more fun stuff, we have to go through the, some more basics about what conformal, what conformal symmetry is, okay? So let's start with a warm-up. So you tell me this warm-up is not necessary. So I'll start with Poincaré transformation. So now all, all I'm doing is doing kinematics and just understanding what are the space-time transformations that constitute 
the conformal the conformal group. Okay. So here, what I'm looking for is transformations. So Poincaré transformations are just transformations that map a point x to x tilde that essentially preserve the, the the Minkowski metric. Oh, by the way, here I'll be cavalier about Euclidean and Lorentzian signature. It's, it's always a metric, so it, you choose if you like Lorentzian or Euclidean. It doesn't really matter very much. And in formulas, this means that you're looking for transformations. So when you map x to x tilde, that have this property. Okay. They preserve the metric. One way of saying this is that these are isometries. So, so Poincaré transformations are isometries. So the isometries means that they preserve the metric and distances of uh, flat space time, flat space. Again, here it can be Rd or R1, D minus 1. I'll leave it up to you. And of course, I think you know exactly what kind of transformations have this property. Uh, should I go through this? How, how to derive what the Poincaré transformations are? Probably not, right? Does anyone want to see how that's done? OK, that's no. But let, let me just say that something that you can derive very easily from here, which, you, which will have a very interesting generalization when we do the conformal transformation, is just by putting this equation together and taking a few derivatives and playing a bit of Sudoku with the equation, you'll find the following interesting equation. Okay. This just follows by from this equation, this fundamental definition. And this equation, uh, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that Poincaré transformations cannot be at most linear in the coordinates. Okay. So let, let's write down the most general Poincaré transformation. It will be a constant. And a, and a linear part, linear part. And of course, we know so that it has here d parameters. So this mu are arbitrary constants. And these guys are arbitrary antisymmetric matrices, which you can check by plugging in into, the, into the equation. Here you get d d minus 1 over 2 parameters, which by plugging into here, obey the usual uh, Lorentz algebra. It's, it's the definition of a Lorentz transformation. OK? Good. So that's a one way, one very simple way in which to think about the Poincaré group. This is the group of transformations that preserves uh, the Minkowski metric. Okay? It preserves angles and it preserves distances. Okay? Something that I want to say that you may have seen, but uh, I want to mention because it will be important when we discuss the, an analog story for the conformal group is that uh, so here in particular the Lorentz transformations uh, generate if I write let, let's focus now for simplicity because maybe you have more intuition about to four dimensions so this generates the group O1 comma three is that are people familiar that this equation is equivalent to the definition of matrices that generate O1, 3? OK, yes. So that's important to, re to remind ourselves that when we study quantum field theories, we do not require that the quantum field theory is invariant under the full O1, 3 group. Okay? That's a very important point. O1, 3 has uh, four components. You may have seen this. So I'll probably be quickly. So it has the connected component. So these are the transformations that are connected to the identity. So one way to think about them, these are the transformations that if you start near the, let's call the point the origin, if you make a, trans a small transformation, you will remain near the origin. So these are connected components, connected to the identity. This sometimes is called the proper orthogonal uh, subgroup of O1, 3. And then all quantum field theories, all of course Lorentz invariant, have these invariants. And then there are three other co components that are disconnected that essentially are given by, by 
such elements, but multiplied either by parity, space-time parity, time reversal, and PT. Okay? So here let me just say what this is. So P is space-time parity. So for example, taking one coordinate, your particular one, x1 to x, and reversing the sign. This changes the orientation of space-time. And t, which is time reversal. So it takes x0. OK, I'm doing the Lorentzian case there, so and reverse this time. Okay. And as I said, all that we require in quantum field theory is that the theory is invariant under this transformation. A theory may or may not be invariant under parity or, or time reversal. Do, do you, can you give me an example of a, of a theory that is not invariant under parity? Sorry? The weak interaction, yes. So it's kind of an important example. So the standard model is not invariant under uh, parity. I mean, the fermions couple. Fermions of the same chirality coupled to the gate field differently. So, the, so the, 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 therefore, we should really keep in our mind that we are only imposing this, not necessarily this. Okay. Of course, I that any relativistic quantum field theory should obey, which is a very important constraint, is that, of course, it has this, but it should also be a CPT invariant. So it should be invariant under the product of PT times charge conjugation. So that, this is called the CPT theorem. So the standard model is definitely CPT invariant, even though it's not parity invariant. OK. Uh, so since you're hackers at the Poincare group, I will not deliver it more. Uh, now, OK, so maybe something I should say, because this might be useful, is that how would we, so here, here this was a statement about flat space. What would be the analog statement if we were being on a curved background? The reason this will be important is that sometimes in conformal field theory it will be useful by a particular type of transformation to map flat space to a curved space. And then the question of what are the symmetries or isometries of that space is relevant. And we don't understand how, how do we find the isometries of a given manifold that has a metric G. Okay. Sorry? Soft killings equations, yes. Okay, so to describe the isometries. In a metric G, it will be very similar. So what you have to solve, so you have a met, okay, it will be something like G minus at x. So there are again transformations, of space time. Now this will be a curved space time in general that preserve the metric, the, the, the metric, yeah. Okay. And if you want to find what is the infinitesimal form of the transformations that generate the isometries, what you have to do is essentially, OK, so since, you know, since I think you know what this is, you have to look at transformations that preserve the metric. So it means that delta g mu is 0. And then all that you need to know is that how do, if, I make, if I make an infinitesimal transformation, so I, I say x tilde is x plus a small transformation zeta, how does the metric change under such a, this is called a diffeomorphism. How, how does the metric change? Yeah, so it's the lead derivative with respect to this vector. So this is some vector field. Yeah, is, is there something I say that you're not familiar with? So I'm going to use a language like I'm assuming that you know what these words mean. If not, I'm happy to explain them. But uh, So you have a vector field zeta psi mu. And what you say is that and then in infinitesimal diffeomorphism, the metric changes in this way. Okay. And now you can compute what this guy is. Okay. And the fact that it's an isometry is a statement that you have to find vector fields zeta that obey this equation, the killing equation. Well, it's not, yes, this is the lead derivative acting on a metric. Yes. Uh, 
general definition of what? Uh, of so leader derivative essentially. Oof, okay, this will be. A, I'll, I'll try to say it in a few words, and if if that's not too much, we can discuss it later. No, it's kind of important because uh, in the following sense that you know we're 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 doing a coordinate we're doing uh, a transformation in space time. You need to understand how objects in space time transform under space time transformation. And those are governed by the essentially the derivative, the infinitesimal one. And the idea is that you have a tensor, imagine you have a tensor in space time, and you make a coordinate transformation. Okay? You know how this how the tensor transforms under a coordinate transformation. The lead derivative is essentially the statement of okay. So if I make a, a transformation and I have a set of fields or tensors in space-time, I'm not going to put indices, but okay, no, I'm, I'm going to put indices. So I have O A of X. So A could tell you information about what kind of tensor this is. If it's a metric tensor, it's an antisymmetric tensor, it's a spinner, whatever. Under such a diffeomorphism, the tensor transformed into some object. And then the lead derivative is essentially the, the, the variation of O, which is okay. Can you read? Okay. Let, me, let me try to do it better. No, but it's good. You should you should ask questions. Otherwise, there's a danger that I'll go, I'll go too fast. Yeah. So. I define delta O of X is the difference between the transformed tensor minus the original tensor. This, by definition, is the lead derivative acting on that tensor. So they're the same, uh, they're the same arguments. Yeah. Uh, yes, here in the same argument. So if, if you can just work out, you, you know how the metric, how the metric, trans okay, so maybe you should say that under the diffeomorphism, transforms like this. Okay, this is something I'll write one, once and never again. But <laughs> anyway, these are the kind of things that you really have to understand by yourself. This is not something that someone can explain to you. You have to really sit down and understand where the tildes go and so on, otherwise you go crazy. But th this is how a metric transforms under a coordinate transformation. And now just go home and compute delta G, okay, delta G mu. Actually, I think with my definitions, Okay, so here, I guess, with the, with the sign I've chosen, I think here I would have a minus sign. Okay, this is the, the detail, it doesn't matter. Okay? And you can do that for any tensor. Okay? So again, this is the killing equation for that metric. Okay, and this, the, the space of solutions, the, the, so you will have a set of vector fields that solve this equation, and just like these vector fields, Generate the transform the symmetry the symmetry group of the of Minkowski space. The vector fields on this that solve this equation generate the symmetry group of that particular metric. Okay. Yes, no, of course, this is only the connected component. Yes, I'm doing infinitesimal transformations near the identity. Yeah, so you may have to worry about global global issues. Of course. Okay. So I don't, I don't think, I think I can skip this. Okay, so now, so this, this was hopefully mostly a review of what Poincaré transformations are, and now we want to see how things change when we talk about enlarge the set of transformations to conformal transformations. Okay, uh, let me put this down. Okay, can I use, I can use this, I guess. Okay, so now a conformal transformation will be 
a similar idea. You have a manifold. Okay, for the time being, we will focus on flat space time. And you do a transformation like this, x to x tilde. This is, a, in general, nonlinear function of x. Okay? And now what you demand is that this transformation has the property that preserves the metric up to a scale. Okay? So what this means physically is that you look at transformations that preserve angles between vectors, but not distances. Okay? So in formulas, what you're, what you're, what you're solving is this. So there's going to be some scale factor, space-dependent space scale factor, times the line element. So you, you've changed the distance by a space-dependent factor. Okay? Now, there is an important question about whether there's a solution of such diffeomorphisms. Okay? It just happened that uh, in Minkowski space, for example, there were solutions to this equation. In general, if I give you a crazy enough metric, a generic metric will not have any solution to this equation. Okay? So it could, in fact, for, for, for generic manifolds, there is not going to be a solution to this equation. Okay? But for flat space, there is a solution. There are solutions to this equation. In fact, uh, flat space and its conformal partners admit the largest possible set of transformations that preserve this, okay? Okay, so let's study, no, so this, I guess I'll study in a bit more detail. Maybe not, we'll see. So I, I, one way to try to solve this equation is again, just, this is just a rewriting. So the first thing is, you, you, to give you an intuition of what's going on here, now I can do the following trivial but perhaps illuminating thing. I can bring this guy here and write this in the following form. So I can write this. Notice that uh, in, in a form very similar to this. So let me define now some uh, matrix M of X, which is Then by bringing this guy here, it should be clear that this matrix is an orthogonal matrix. Okay? Is that clear? So if you wish, a conformal transformation is like a local Lorentz transformation. Okay? So it's a Lorentz transformation that is not isotropic. It can be different here than it, can, than, than it is here. Okay. Good. So now what we want to do is study the solutions to this equation when we make an infinitesimal transformation. So transformations that are close to the identity. Okay. So how, how do you do that? The way you do that is you... That's why I went through that perhaps quickly over this analysis here because it will be similar, okay? So what I do is I, I, I make a small perturbation of x to a nearby point and the transformation is generated by a vector field chi, okay? Then, by looking at this equation, it should be clear that you get this. Okay, now, of course, okay. Omega, since I'm doing an infinitesimal transformation, omega will also be close to one. It will be one plus a small correction, right? So let, let me define, so for a small transformation, this is one plus sigma, okay? So here, what, you, what you're going to get is uh, two sigma, it amino. Okay? Now, by taking the trace of this equation, so multiplying both sides by it amino, 
you, you discover that sigma is 1 over the space-time dimension times the gradient of the vector field. Okay? So the equation that we have to analyze is the following equation. Sorry? Um, let's see. Well, well um, well, definitely we want omega squared to be positive. Sure. That's a good question. Uh, okay, actually, we, we can compute what omega is. Okay, so omega, oh, well, there's a square root there, so you may worry about this. So if I take the determinant of this equation, yeah. it tells you that omega is essentially the, some Jacobian. Yes. But you could imagine, okay, I can do some minus sign. There are two things that will square that same statement. Yeah. Flip the sign. Yeah. 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 So it doesn't matter if it's in the future. Yeah, not yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that's, that's the right way to go, yeah. Okay, so the question that we want to study is this. So, okay. so now, uh, okay, something that I wanted to say before, in, in maybe in pictures, that follows from this to kind of highlight the effect of conformal transformation is that, these are, as I said, these are transformations that, as it should be obvious from here uh, or from here, preserve uh, angles but not distances. So what, what it can happen is that if you grid, if, if you put a grid on your space time, and then you make a conformal transformation, you can warp it in, in crazy ways. But the angle between points will not be changed in any way. Okay. So that, that, that's kind of the geometrically how you should think about conformal transformation. It just, it, it's kind of, it's blind to distances, but it's very respectful to angles. And one exercise that I, uh, uh, to convince us, okay, but I haven't told you yet what the transformations are, but one of the basic properties that conformal transformations have is that they map spheres to spheres, uh, which of course preserve angles. Okay, so now we want to solve this equation. Uh, in the case of, of the Poincare group, I didn't tell you how to do it, but it's a trivial exercise to start from here and take a few derivatives and derive this equation by a very similar procedure that I leave for you as an exercise. You can now combine these equations and put it back on a, you know, a bit of gymnastics. What you, what you prove now is something stronger than no, no, weaker, I mean, than in the Lorentz case. What you find now is that the killing vector satisfies this equation, which means that the killing vector is at most quadratic in the space-time coordinates, okay? Poincare transformations were at most linear, so you had a constant inhomogeneous part and a linear part. Here we will have up to a quadratic part, okay? So now you can go ahead and write down the most general quadratic part. They will, they will, they will have a zero order piece, a linear piece, and a quadratic piece. Then you plug it back into the equation, and you find what is the most general tensors that this guy can be decomposed with respect to, okay? This is, again, an elementary exercise. And what you find is that just like here, the most general solution could be parameterized in terms of these parameters A mu and lambda mu nu that gave rise to 013. If I had done the infinitesimal version, it would be the S13. Here you can decompose the most general vector in the following way. So this is the solution to the problem of what is the most general conformal transformation that you can have in space time. Right now, there's a discussion of a generic D. In, 
in D equals two, then some miracles will happen. That's, and that's why these miracles allow you to do so many things with conformal structures in two dimensions. So here, the, the space of solutions of this, of course, is finite dimensional. There are, uh, there are uh, only a fi finite number of quadratic poly polynomials, quadratic in, the, in X's that you can write down. And these are these. So of course, you, you have to have what you had before. These are the Lorentz transformations, Poincare transformations. You have translations and rotations. You can have terms linear in mu per lambda. And then a slightly disgusting looking quadratic term, which you can parametrize by, you can write in this way. So, and the transformations are parametrized by the following parameters. So, then we'll do some counting. So we have a mu, omega mu nu, uh, b mu. With this guy is anti-symmetric, as it was before, and lambda. So, no. yes? Wouldn't you need any anything with some pre index in the two square squared term? Oh, sorry, no, this is. No, this is B mu. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so let's count parameters. So let, let me put this guy here. So then you have. A mu, B mu. So from here we get D parameter. This is a vector. These are two independent vectors. And you have a one real parameter. So you get from here 2D plus one parameters. And from here you just get a D by D anti-symmetric matrix. So you get D, D minus one over two parameters. So summing this up, you get one half D plus two, D plus one parameters. So the set of independent transformations that you can write down, conformal you can write down in flat space, has that, that many degrees of freedom, okay? As I said, something very special that happens in two dimensions is that, let me do a small parenthesis, because I think the last week of the course will be devoted to two dimensions, but just to show you some fun things. So you, you take this equation, Actually, what I'm saying is that if you, if you look at this equation in two dimensions, what follows from here is that you get the cauchy riemann equations, or equivalently, the fact that any vector field that's holomorphic, so z, okay, so now in two dimensions, they find z to be x1 plus ix2. So now I'm in Euclidean signature. If it wasn't Lorentzian signature, it would be the light cone derivative. What you find is that any vector field that's holomorphic generates a conformal transformation. And since you have an infinite number of holomorphic vector fields, they will have singularities, but anyway, on the plane, the, the, conformal, the set of conformal transformations in two dimensions is infinite dimensional. So that's why the dynamics of conformal field fields in two dimensions is very highly constrained because you have an infinite number of symmetries constraining the physics. Okay, but enough about two dimensions. Uh, now we want to understand what is the algebra of transformations, of conformal transformations. So, okay, so maybe, so I don't have to do too much. How, how would you compute it? How, how would you, given, the, given this information, how would you compute the algebra that such conformal transformations generate? Lee brackets. Do, do people know what Lee brackets means? I mean, so if you take, you can take the commutator, which is a Lee bracket, of two vector fields and it gives you different vector fields. Okay? Essentially, what you have to do is take 
one vector field, say the vector field associated to the transformation parameters by A, which is the most boring one, and take the commutator with the vector field, say, of that's parameterized by lambda. Okay? This will have to give you, by definition, this is something that follows from, from uh, the, the, the algebra that, that conformal, conformal, vector, conformal vector fields have to satisfy. The commutator of these two vector fields has to give you a different vector field, conformal vector field. Okay? So essentially what you have to do is compute V1, V2. So these are two vector fields. And it has to give you a different vector field, OK? Well, you can, I mean, just by, from, from this analysis, it's easy to find out what V3 mu is. Is V1 nu d nu V2 mu minus V2 nu d nu V1 mu. So let me so, if, so what we do is we associate to a mu we associate a generator p mu to omega mu nu a generator m mu nu which has to be anti-symmetric because this guy is anti-symmetric to lambda we associate a generator d and to p mu, we generate a generator k mu, okay? Again, there is a vector field associated to each of these guys. So now you can go ahead and compute all possible commutators of the vector field associated to each of these different generators, okay? And that will give you the algebra. Notice that if you do that, if you do that for this, and if you've never done it, you should try. If you do that for these guys, you're gonna get the Poincaré algebra by doing this. So now I need a blackboard. Okay, this is again something I'll only do once, never again, which is write down the commutation relations uh, obeyed by the generators of the corresponding conformal transformation. So one part of it, of course, is something that you already know, but I'll write it anyway, which is the Poincaré sub algebra. So the conformal algebra obviously has a Poincaré sub algebra, which is generated by these two guys, okay? So you're going to have Lorentz transformations, mu nu rho sigma. So this will obey the usual stuff. Try to be reasonably consistent in notation. And then there are three other terms that are completely fixed by symmetry. So by the anti-symmetry of M, of M, okay? Is that clear? Or should I write down all the terms? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But if you take the case for a generic D, but if you take M equals D, doesn't sigma even get anything? Yeah, no, so D equals two is it has to be treated separately. Okay. Yeah. So this wasn't Yeah, no, so this is generic D yeah, so generic D except for D equals two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This formula is still true for D equals two, but this is what generated what's called the global conformal transformation. So these are transformations on the plane that have no singularities on the plane. You can have uh, ones that have singularities, say, at the North Pole. Okay. But, but so, so, so this guy is still true, but it, it doesn't capture the extra transformations that you have, holomorphic transformations that you can have, that are not defined everywhere on the plane, but can have a singularity on the plane. Okay, so I think you know, if not, ask me. I can write down what the other terms is. Again, this is just fixed by anti-symmetry, anti-symmetrizing with respect to mu nu and rho sigma. Most of the commutators are pretty intuitive. They essentially tell you things that you know. Okay, so this guy has a, this guy has a vector index, so it better transform as a vector. This guy has a vector index, so it better transform as a vector under Lorentz transformations, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, but anyway, I will feel guilty if I don't write this once.
And again, there is one extra term that's by anti-symmetry. Okay, let me, since it's only one more, I'll write it. <laughs> so here I, I anti-symmetrize in mu and nu. And this is, of course, uh, the Poincaré algebra. So now we want to start understanding what's going on with the other guys. So, okay. What do you think will be the, the result of this commutator? So is it exactly the same as P, right? So what, what, the physical way to think about this, of course, I, I never remember any of this, but the, the way to remember, to know what it has to be is to know that P is a vector under Lorentz transformations. And this is precisely what this right-hand side tells you. It transforms as a vector under Lorentz transformations. So this guy also has a vector index, so it has to be exactly the same. Good. The other ones are, no, this, the, the ones I'm going to write down are really, will be fundamental later on. Oh, by the way, no, yeah. One thing I didn't emphasize, but I think it should be obvious, that one guy that was the guy that we discussed heavily yesterday is, was, had to do with this transformation, right? So the transformation where x mu goes to 1 plus lambda x mu, right? This was exactly the dilatation generator. So we will care a lot about this particular generator D. The name of the game, or one of the games we want to play, is to diagonalize the operator D. It will tell us the spectrum of dimensions of the theory. So now I want to know how D, uh, what algebra D obeys. And what you find is that this. So some intuition about this. So first of all, D has no indices. So it better commute with M, you know, okay? That's just a tell them that it's a scalar under Lorentz transformations. And the way you should think about this algebra that we'll study much, uh, this commutator that we will study much more detail, that notice that this looks a little bit like creation annihilation commutation relations in the harmonic oscillator. You have a Hamiltonian, H, it's, okay, it's D here, and you have raising and lowering operators that raise or lower the energy. Notice that here they come with, op with different signs, okay? So you have a raising operator and a lowering operator. Or, yeah, it's also similar to angular momentum. You have J3, J plus, J minus. So one raises the spin, one lowers the spin. And that's how we're going to construct representations, very similar to how you construct representations in spin. Except, okay, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. And the other really important commutation relation is this, so P mu, K nu. So something you can already predict from here is the following. So P, let's say that P has charge one under dilatation. It has charge minus one, K has charge minus one. So this object P, and K, P, P with K has to have charge zero, okay? So what things can appear on the right-hand side? Sorry? M's, something else? ends on this because everyone else is charged, okay? Good. So there are two possibilities. There is a, sym uh, a symmetric piece. Where you get the dilatations. And the anti-symmetric piece where you get Lorentz rotation. Okay? Good. And that's it. So I would say, yeah, so this is it. I mean, I, and Every commutator has a, a given intuition that you have to develop to appreciate what, what physics is behind it, okay? And this just follows by associating to each generator the vector field with the corresponding parameter and just doing elementary algebra, okay? The last one is this. So D, sorry, P has charge minus one with respect to D. K has charge plus one. Okay, I think I said the opposite the other time before, it doesn't matter. But the, the thing that's crucial is that they have opposite charges. And therefore, if I, if I look at the commutator of D with this guy, this has charge zero, right? Imagine I want to compute the charge of the commutator of P with K. 
I will look at the commutator with B, will tell you that it has charge zero, and therefore whatever you have on the right hand side has to have charge zero. And D obviously commutes with this, it means that D has charge zero, and uh, M has charge zero. Okay. And if you want to really be pedantic and check it, here are the, the vector fields associated. So now I, I just use kind of uh, notation associated to the generator itself, a vector field. So if, if just to be clear what the, what the vector fields are. So special conformal is a bit disgusting, but what can you do? We will soon develop an intuition about what this guy does for a living. And then D is, okay. So these are the vector fields associated to the uh, generator, okay? And later on we will ex extract lo lots of physics from the constraints that implementing this, al this, this algebra on uh, operators and on the Hilbert space of the field, of the field theory uh, has to, has to say, basically. Okay, so now, so this was just a, ran, if, you see, if you wish, this is a random collection of com commutators, but there is some structure here that we want to exploit, which is this. So now what you can do is take particular uh, clever linear combinations of the generators and define the following. So they find a new index mu, m, sorry, that encodes m, and I have two new, new indices, d, d plus one, okay? And so, and let's say that I, I'm in signature, so I'm in, imagine I'm doing a Euclidean signature, I'm in RD in Euclidean signature, so mu will have all plus signs, so have D of those. Okay, this is, not, ah. Okay, the point is that the, the, the two extra indices that I've added, one has a plus and the other one has a minus, okay? So one has Lorentzian signature, the other one has Euclidean signature, okay? Then if I define L mu nu to be Lorentz generator, L, D, D plus one, okay, capital D, which is a dilatation generator. L mu D is a diagonal sum of translation and special conformal transformations. Oh, I didn't give you the name. So th this guy means is a generator with special conformal transformations. And then I have L mu D plus one which is the other linear combination. Okay, the point of doing this is that if you now use these commutation relations, what you're able to prove, giving this definition of LMN, where now you have increased the range of the indices by two, is that this guy obeys Uh, uh, a Lorentz algebra with signature. So this, so this obeys. So that means the conformal algebra. I've rewritten the conformal algebra in a way that makes manifest that it admits the action of SO1 D plus one, because the metric here has all pluses and one minus. Yes. It will be, it will be the, uh, yeah. To me, Lorentz transformation, for this purpose, Lorentz transformations or rotations is all the same. Yeah. But I, I can write, so, so for Euclidean space, so this will be for Euclidean, for R, D, for Lorentzian,
Sorry? That's fine. Yes. I mean, you can check that, for example, these two guys obey this algebra. If you wish, yeah. yeah. It's like A and A dagger and X and P in quantum mechanics. You can decompose X into A plus A dagger and P as A minus A dagger. You can think a little bit like that. These are perfectly good operators, right? And the point is that if you combine these two, you will get precisely this commutator. The whole point of doing this is just to give this crazy, the conformal algebra, a name that we all know. This guy is the uh, Lorenz algebra with these signatures. That, that's the whole point. So essentially, the, 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 the end point of, it, of this analysis is that the algebra of conformal transformations in d dimensions is SO1, d plus 1 in Euclidean signature and SO2, d in Lorenz signature. Yes. Uh, for the index commutator, then we cycle over all indices? Of course, from all of them, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, any questions about this? This is kind of one of the highlights of this lecture to exhibit what is the algebra that we'll have to impose on our on operators and on the Hilbert space. It's just, at the end of the day, it's actually something simple. It's just an orthogonal group. Yes? Is uh, the diagonal component of L and the P and D plus 1 are zero? No, these are anti-symmetric, right? So L, okay, oh, yeah. yeah, L is anti-symmetric. That, I mean, that's why it generates SO uh, transformation. Okay, and here you have to anti-symmetrize, so plus. Antisymmetrization. Okay, so there is more to the conformal transformation than this. So this was an analysis by construction about uh, infinitesimal transformations. So transformations that are connected to the identity. So transformations that if, if you take a point near the origin, it will map to a point nearby the origin. There is a particularly important and interesting transformation that is not connected to the identity, which is, plays a very similar role to parity in the, Poincare, in the Lorentz algebra. So parity is, a, is not connected to the identity. It maps a point here to a point far away. In, uh, there is a, an analogous transformation, conformal transformation, which is discrete. It's not a continuous transformation. Just like parity is not a continuous transformation. It's a discrete transformation that nevertheless will help us a lot in unraveling the constraints of conformal, of conformal invariant. Okay, so there's a particular transformation that you can do. It's called inversion. So inversion is a transformation that maps x mu to x mu over x squared. So let, now let's just, for simplicity, think of uh, an Euclidean signature, okay? So there are several things you can say about this. This is, you can easily check, uh, it's still written somewhere. Okay, you can, maybe let me write it. So you can easily check that this is a conformal transformation. Remember, let me write it one more time. So if you just compute this Jacobian to go from here to here, what you discover is that under such transformations, you get a scale factor, which, which is 1 over x squared. Okay? So this is indeed a good uh, conformal transformation. This is just to make it explicit it's a conformal transformation. So some things to say is that it is a Z2 transformation. So if I square it, I go back to the identity. It's not, it's not doing anything. Another important point is that ah, it maps geometrically. So, so that, that's why it's not in the connected component. Geometrically, so you, you, you can take your space and draw a unit sphere around the origin. 
So you have a unit sphere. And essentially, inversion maps all the points inside the sphere to the points outside. Okay. That's why it's not connected to the, it's not connected to the, the identity. In particular, the origin goes to infinity. Okay. In the set transformation. But geometrically, it does that. It, it maps the unit sphere to the outside and vice versa. The other thing to say is that it, reverse, it reverses orientation. Space-time or space orientation. By the way, just like parity. Why? Okay. Uh. <coughs> okay, so what do I want to say? Uh. Sorry? How do you say that it's reversed Okay, so the exercise. Take dx1, dxd. This is the volume form. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with Oh, take the epsilon tensor. It will change the sign of the epsilon tensor under this transformation. Okay, but what if you do this in uh, space time, but you have to be careful not to change anything now? Uh, you have to be careful. And then there is a whole subtle story about conformally compactifying Minkowski yeah. space which we will not necessarily get too much into it here. You, this can be taken care of by conformally compactifying Minkowski space uh, properties. Yeah. yeah, but, but then even if you take that, you just take the Epsilon tensor and you do this. Yes, yes, yes. And this will change sign under such transformation. I mean, for parity, it's obvious, right? I mean, yeah. But for here, OK, it's almost obvious. I mean, you have to do some computation to, to see it. Uh, So actually, the conformal group, the reason I mentioned this is that there are several things to say. So first of all, the conformal group, uh, which includes also these connected components, actually can be generated by the following thing. You take the Poincaré transformations and inversions. If you combine these two transformations, you will generate the whole conformal transformation. Is that obvious? Or? Sorry? Yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm allowing I'm allowing the the Poincaré group, so that will have already time reversal, right? Maybe it's not completely obvious, but you, you, you should go ahead and think about it. Uh, one thing that you can do is you can take the Poincaré transformations and conjugate them by inversion and see what you get. And this will be important in order to understand what is the so notice that this transformation that I wrote down here is the infinitesimal form of the conformal transformation. So the ones generated by translations, rotations, and so on. In particular, one of the things that we want to do is understand how to do the finite form of the transformation for the special conformal. Okay? And that guy is, this guy is very useful in this respect. Do I want to keep this? No, I don't want to raise this ever again. Uh, this I don't care about. Time flies here, it's crazy. Okay. Okay, so essentially, one thing I want to say is that if you take, uh, you conjugate translation by inversion, okay? Let's do it. So x mu will go to, so let, let me sk skip a, a step. You tell me if you, you agree with this result. which I can write as x mu plus a mu x square divided by 1 plus a square x square plus 2ax, OK? So if you take, trans of course, if, if you take Lorentz transformations, Lorentz generators, and you conjugate them, you get back, if you wish, Lorentz transformation, OK? So it's invariant under conjugate by inversion. What this guy is precisely scale is the special conformal transformation. So now we can develop some kind of intuition what the special conformal transformation is. 
It's just an inversion, which we have an intuition for. I mean, we're here, and then you map something there, followed by a translation, followed by an inversion. This is what a spatial conformal transformation is. And one way you can convince yourself is that expand this, do an infinitesimal transformation. So expand this to, to first order in A mu, which is the a small parameter of the transformation. And what you find is that X mu gets mapped to X mu plus A mu X square minus But, and this is precisely, this is precisely this guy, okay? So this actually proves that this guy is the finite, first of all, this is the finite form of the, conform, the special conformal transformation, and that you can obtain it by uh, uh, conjugation. So this tells you that by taking the Poincaré and inversions, we can already get a special conformal. And now, essentially, by looking at this commutator, you can see that by combining these two, you can get dilatation. Okay. Good. Oof, there's something I wanted to say. Should I say it or not? Maybe I'll say it quickly. If it's incomprehensible, I'll, I'll say it again next time. Uh, so, of course, something that's very nasty about conformal transformations, as opposed to Poincaré transformations, is that, in particular, this guy, or you can also look at the infinitesimal ones, is that they're highly nonlinear, right? These are nonlinear functions of x. I mean, so you want to try to think whether you can develop some picture of how to linear, linearize this transformation. And there is a useful construction that I just want to mention briefly because it's exactly actually related to this comment about compactification and so on. It also plays an important role in twister theory in ADS CFT. So let me just mention it maybe quickly. Uh, okay. So essentially what we want to do is similar to what we do with the two-sphere. So I'll give you a two-sphere. The asymmetry of the two-sphere are slightly nasty. So of course, the two-sphere is, is invariant under SO3. Uh, but one way of making the symmetries of the, of the, of the two-sphere manifest is by embedding S2 in R3 and defining by throw, an, embed, an embedding like this, okay? okay? Then the edge of isometries are just trivially realized as just some rotations, linear transformations on the axis, okay? And this is useful. I mean, uh, for example, if you want to construct Spherical harmonics for scalars, tensors, whatever, it is very convenient not to worry about the, the curved coordinates on the two sphere, but construct everything using the flat coordinate in the embedding space. This is a very simple way of constructing S, S, SU2 invariant objects. So, similarly to this, you can do a similar story for the conformal group. So, take our space time where we're studying it that we're studying, let's say now the Lorentzian case, and uh, embed this as a hypersurface in R2, D, okay? Uh, again, it's very similar to that story I had there with the algebra. So I have coordinate Y mu, where mu, or M, sorry, goes with mu, D, D plus one. Okay, and this guy has Lorentzian signature because I'm doing at Lorentzian space time, and this guy has signature d has signature plus and d plus one d has signature minus. Okay. Now I want to define the analog of an SO3 invariant surface. So, because remember now that the conformal group we already established that was SO2 comma d. Okay, that was the whole point of that exercise. So one way of uh, writing down an SO2 invariant surface is just to look at this. Uh, okay. 
This is an SO2, comma, the invariant constraint. Of course, this gives you one constraint. So we've gone from d plus 2 to d plus 1 dimension. We still want to go down to d dimensions, right? So the extra constraint that you're going to impose is that you, some project, projective constraint. So that we're going to identify ym is going to be identified up to a scale. Okay? So this gives you another constraint. So that goes down from d plus 2 to d. Okay? And this constraint, of course, is still SO2, comma, d covariant. Okay? So it's a, it's, a, it's a good constraint that still preserves the symmetry that we're tr actually trying to make manifest. Okay? So that means that on these embedding coordinates, y, we have an obvious action of uh, SO2, comma, d. Okay. Up to overall Sorry. Up to overall yes. yes. No, but I'm saying that. I'm saying that. Okay. The, the, so you. Yes, but I'm saying that these two constraints are so. Are so two comma d covariant. Yeah. So now you, you can try to solve this constraint. So you define your space-time coordinates, x mu, to be this, uh, y mu, y d, plus y d plus 1. Okay? This gives you a map between light rays in this higher dimensional space and points in space-time. So it's a map between light rays And points okay. if you know something about twister theory this should remind you something and then the, the whole point is that the action the linear action of in general let's say o2 comma d on the coordinates once restricted to this curve linear coordinates precisely reduces to the conformal transformation okay so this trick is a way of representing the nonlinear transformations on the space-time coordinates, d-dimensional space-time coordinates x mu, as linear transformations on, uh, on an auxiliary space that next manifests the SO2 comma d symmetry. And this is useful when you want to constrain correlation functions. Sometimes it's instead of using uh, the curve, not, not the curve, but the d-dimensional coordinates that have very nonlinear transformations, you write things in terms of the embedding space, and then it's obvious what is the most general tensor that you can write down that has SO2 comma D symmetry. So that's why it's useful. Okay, and uh, I can leave you as an exercise to the motivated student to, for example, write down the various SO2 comma 2 matrices that once it acts on the vector Like this, and given this dictionary, will generate all conf the conformal transformations. Okay. In particular, something that I want to mention is that here you, you can easily prove from this embedding that inversion It's just, an, it's just a transformation, a very simple transformation in this embedding space. It's just, a, it's just a transformation that inverts one of the coordinates. Okay? So that makes it obvious, just like in analogy with parity, that inversion is in the disconnected component of the conformal group, of this group, sorry. And for example, parity, which is any one of them, say y1 equals y1, 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 y1 minus 1, it's also in the, in the disconnected component. But the thing that's important is that these two guys, these two transformations, are conjugate 
inside the connected component of the conformal group. Okay. So what what does this mean? What this means is this. Let me not erase this again. Uh, so just like for the Poincaré group, we declared a statement of what is the symmetry that any field theory should be invariant under. This was the connected component. For a conformal field theory, the statement is that it has to be invariant under the connected component. Let, let me call it SO2, D of the conformal group. Okay? And it may or may not be invariant under, part, uh, under inversion. Okay, so may or not be invariant under inversion. And actually, you can, precisely because inversion, this is the statement I was trying to make here maybe too fast. Since parity and inversion are conjugate to each other in SO2, D, uh, the theory will not be invariant under inversion if it's not parity invariant. Okay, so if you break parity, you break inversion. Okay, this is a cookie notation, but hopefully you know what I mean. Okay, so you have to be very careful, and people are not careful about this. When you when you impose constraints on a abstractly on a conformal field theory, sometimes people just use inversion over and over again, and by doing that, you may miss terms that are allowed in theories that break parity. Okay? So I just want to make, mention this point because uh, well, people in the community are a bit, a bit sloppy about this point. And there are, in fact, new terms that you get uh, that are allowed in correlation functions that are uh, present if you only impose SO2, D and not inversions. And, sorry? Yeah, well, that's the question. Uh, inversion actually is a combination of some special conformal transformations. Sorry, sorry? I mean, I mean inversion is a finite uh, form of some special combination of special conformal transformations and the shifts, okay? So it can be. No, no, what do you mean? No. I mean, special conformal transformations are connected to the identity. Inversion is not. You're, you're never going to get something uh, disconnected from the identity. From something connected to the identity. Maybe misunderstanding the question. Well, well, well. No, no. I, I was very careful. What I said is that. If you do inversion, translation, and inversion, you get a special conformal. But you, you, you act with inversion twice. Uh -huh. That's the point. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yes. Is there an CPD? Yes. Uh, of course. Conformal field theories are. Yeah. CPD, yeah. Yes. So yes. Okay. But this. The analog, the analog of time reversal. Mm -hmm. Is okay. It exactly actually has to do with. If you, if you wish, but, uh, with inversion. Mm -hmm. What we will see later is that there is a notion of quantization in conformal field theories, which is called radial quantization, mm -hmm. where instead of defining, usually when we quantize field theories, we define our Hilbert space by defining some fixed time slice, say x0 equals 0. You, you develop a Hilbert space and you evolve your states with the, the Hamiltonian, right? Yeah. In conformal field theories, there is a very useful way of thinking about quantizing the theory where you choose a different initial value surface to define your Hilbert space. So you imagine you're in RD. You choose constant spheres. Rather. At each point, you can associate a Hilbert space of the theory. And uh, now, what plays the role of time evolution from this point of view, which was moving the states forward in time, the Hamiltonian the role of the Hamiltonian is played by the dilatation operator, which precisely maps this sphere to a nearby sphere. Okay. It's a Cauchy problem, yeah. Okay, there are people outside. I don't know what they're doing, but uh, 
Is, is there something going on here? At five? Oh, there's plenty of time. Uh, okay, so maybe. So I guess this concludes kind of the more. Ah, okay, the, the last maybe the, the last thing I wanted to say that I want you to check is to think geometrically, and this will be very easy from the statement I made about the fact that the conformal transformations are, can be thought of as being generated by Poincaré plus inversion. An exercise that you want you may try to prove just to get an intuition about what these transformations do is to prove that. Under conformal transformation, any n-dimensional sphere gets mapped to an n-dimensional sphere, possibly degenerate, because it can become Rn. So I, I, I think of Rn and Sn as being the same thing by adding a point to infinity. And this should be easy to prove just using inversion. Just prove that under inversion, a sphere maps to a sphere or a plane. If you do inversion, with respect to a point on the sphere, of course, you're going to map this point to infinity, and that's going to give you Rn. Otherwise, you get the sphere. Okay? And this is also important when we do the, what's called the operator state correspondence, that spheres map to spheres. Okay, I guess we are kicking us out. Yeah, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>